What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Pick Six Podcast, CBS Sports Daily NFL Podcast. I'm Will Brinson. I'm your host. It is Wednesday, September 29th, and that means it's a pow, 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 Brady Quinn football show. Pew, 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 And this edition, what's up, buddy? How you doing? Not much. How are you doing? I mean, your your NC State, your, your Wolfpack had a huge win this past week. Beat a Clemson team that, look, let's be real. It's not the same Clemson team as we're accustomed to seeing. However, huge win, huge win. big. Uh, well, I mean, I'm just saying, like they they you know they're not very good this year. Yeah, they, they don't have that. Deshaun Watson or Trevor Lawrence on the team. I mean, it's, yeah, it's yeah. Well, uh, but, by you know, the way, before DJ, we before we continue on, you, oh, you yeah, mentioned, yeah, before we go, yeah, yeah you mentioned yeah, yeah. you mentioned the NC State game that reminded me I had a great time. With all my friends, I was sipping an ice cold Bud Light, Bud Light in yeah. Carter Finley Stadium because they sell it there now. And that reminds me that this episode, the Brady Quinn Football Show, this episode of the Big Six Podcast, brought to you by. That's right. Pick Six is presented by Bud Light, the official beer sponsor of the NFL. Share a limited edition team can or bottle with us as you listen and watch along you can get your favorite team's bottles and cans clap your hands sent to you budlight.com slash delivery now to order i got my panthers bottle right here hashtag for the fans fun fact brady quinn the carolina panthers since i got my bud light cans they've been undefeated <laughs> undefeated it's unbelievable super bowl I mean, I guess it could be trading for Sam Darnold and uh, acquiring a bunch of really talented young defensive players, or it could be the can. Bud Light. Yeah. yeah. So you want your team to go undefeated on a, on a crazy run? Go to BudLight.com slash delivery to get your cans delivered to you. Um, okay. So, oh, yeah. So, uh, yes, Clemson is not the same. And honestly, um, I, I think it's really under. I think people just sort of assumed that the Clemson was going to. Not we're not spending too much time on Clemson, but I think people just assumed that Clemson was just. Oh well, you know they'll just pop out another Sean Watson, and Trevor Lawrence. It doesn't work like that, man. It's hard. Those guys are well. They they do have a top recruited quarterback or one of the top recruited quarterbacks in his class, and DJ Uyunga Lale, and he did look good last very year. Very nice. So I just call him DJ. You, he did, yeah, he did, he's not. People he, kind of he, call him DJU. Yeah. He, he, he last the year, through last long. year he looked great. He does. You know, what's funny, though, is if you have one criticism of Trevor Lawrence, and in, in fact, all the rookie quarterbacks, I'm not sure if you've, you've w- looked at the number of sacks taken by quarterbacks. I, that I held also the ball saw that. Uh, that's four, that's, four and a half that's, seconds that's, long. Yeah, it's yeah. a bad stat. But the Baker Mayfield being a part of that group is kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. I think it has more to do with their offensive philosophy and how they run the b- football play action pass than anything else. And oh, by the way, he's not under duress with that offensive line. So that's he right. can hold it. He can hold the football for that long. Um, but when he was at Clemson, yes. not a lot. I mean, not a lot of great pass rushers. You don't have a very good against. offensive line either. No, no. Uh, well, that's different in talking about Clemson, but I'm just saying in general, over the course of Trevor Lawrence's career, if oh, there's right, one right, right, thing right. you saw in film, he would get locked in, hold on to the football a little bit too long, trying to wait for a guy to get open. Um, and, and I think that's something that you're seeing a little bit from DJ Uwe Angalale. So, Sorry, I thought you were. I thought you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. DJ felt like he gets locked in on that first read, holds the ball too long, and does it's the it same really, thing that Trevor at times struggled with. Yes, and Trevor maybe a little bit easier to get away with it because he had a better offensive line and didn't have a powerhouse NC State team that he had to deal with. Yeah, baby. Um, I mean, seriously, Clemson didn't play anybody until the playoffs. So, like the entire time Trevor Lawrence was there, uh, he didn't have a regular. That's true. Ball. They did lose to a Notre Dame team. He just wasn't starting that game. Just saying. Just oh, saying. yeah, yeah. Some some say he purposely bailed on it because he was scared of that Notre Dame team. Um, maybe he was. Maybe he needed it on a neutral site, you know? He, you know, maybe it was this, all oh, deeper conspiracy theory. Maybe he didn't want to have to play because he's very lit- religious against Touchdown Jesus, the grotto, all the – that is the the spirit of Notre Dame. Maybe I, he didn't want to have to go there and play. I have been there for, for an NC State game against Notre Dame. We lost in 2017, one of our – Three losses that season, or maybe four losses that season. At any rate, um, it was the McGlinchey, Quentin Nelson, uh, oh, who's animals, 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 absolute. Animals. I mean, we had we had like Bradley Chubb. We had four NFL players on the defensive line, and we got didn't mauled. matter. Yeah, who, uh, God, who's the running the back? Wasn't Josh, who's who's the running back? The meat grinder, Josh Adams, probably. Josh Adams, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he, he was, he, and they he just put out. him in the meat grinder. Is what yeah. they did. That's a, yeah. Shoot him yeah. up, spit him out. Look like sausage on the other side. But but I was going to say when you're sitting because we sat in the um, 
end zone. We had end zone. South feet. end zone. Could you I don't see know. I was staring Jesus? at Jesus the whole time, and it was kind of freaking me yeah, out, south, man. South end zone. South end yeah. zone. So that's probably the only spot you could see it anymore. And if you know the history, since they did now, they've done an addition, but they since they did the 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 original addition to bring it up to like eighty thousand capacity. That's where they built that upper bowl, and they've not mm. won a national championship since they made it impossible to see touchdown Jesus from all parts of the stadium. You can only see it now from the south uh, south end zone. Two, I don't know why we're talking about the 2017 trip to Notre Dame, but uh, but two two points I would make about the Notre Dame uh, facility: one, uh, bathrooms a real problem. It is uh, maybe you go to VIP areas or something like that, but for the for the average. The average blue collar fan, such as my literally blue collar fan, such as myself, um, you know, it, it is, that's uh, not the kind of blue collar we're talking about there, preppy. All right, I know, I know, I know. Pipe, yeah. pipe down over there, with blue collar, blues, and pinks, or whatever that is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, it was a uh, long lines for the bathroom, really hard to get in and out of the bathroom at halftime. Um, but I gotta say, some of the best coffee they oh, serve. Yeah. yeah. Now, I did help that we well, were, and you, and, and you have to appreciate you can drink. Right, like not all stadiums you can do that. I don't think nationwide. So, it, it, yeah, it's not a dry, campus. not a dry campus, not a dry campus. No, not a dry campus. That's right. Uh, okay, so, so you can have Bud Light there. You can enjoy some nice Bud Lights there in South Bend at the Notre Dame right. Stadium. Uh, yeah. Anyway, enjoy, greatly enjoyed our time there. You mentioned rookie quarterbacks struggling with bad offensive lines and holding the ball too long. One of the guys on the list, along with Trevor Lawrence, or no, it was Zach Wilson. Trevor Lawrence is dealing with it too, but. <laughs> oh boy, Justin Fields is on there too. Uh, I don't look, man. I don't. You've played a lot of football in your life, Brady. You ever had? Uh, you ever finished a game where you had, your team had one net passing yard? Not to the best of my recollection. Um, and you, and you, and and you usually, played. Yeah, you, you, usually it's because this. There is a. This is one of the biggest issues I see with young quarterbacks now in the NFL, and it, it goes back to a, a phrase that a quarterback coach said to me once. But PTR protect the rating quarterbacks now especially if they have dual threat ability they do not want to throw away the football it brings down their, their completion percentage you guys will hammer them all the all the folks in the data and analytics so, well look at his completion percentage. look at that unless you've got some pff and you want to kind of dive through all their numbers and they're looking at like the actual you know throwaways and, and throws that were legitimately at a target it then becomes an issue Right. So a lot of these private quarterback coaches are teaching kids at a young age, taking a sack's okay. Mm. You know, trying to scramble and make something happen is okay. Sack, sack is not sack is not treated as a negative quarterback stat in the general lexicon. It's treated as an offensive line negative stat. Exactly. And and you have to understand like my upbringing. I had two uncles who played college ball on the offensive line, one at Brown, one at Kentucky. So from the youngest age, I was always taught you don't want to take a negative play. You want to look out for the big boys in front of you. Right you know, away. run and get what you can, but if not, throw the football away, live to play another down. That was how I was always brought up. A lot of a lot of quarterbacks were brought up that way because they didn't want to have to take negative plays. Nowadays, though, quarterbacks aren't taught that. They're mm-hmm. taught that it's all about the stats, protect the rating, do what you t- can to avoid the interception, but at all costs, hold on to the football, take the sack. So uh, it's, it, it, it's a sad, like, it, it's, it's sad that you see it all the time because you're watching it going, just throw the ball away. Yeah. Stop taking negative plays. That gives you no shot on the following down, having to play behind the sticks constantly. That's part uh, of it. By the way, so the Bears gained a total of 47 yards. And I was looking at these research notes. It was like, it's diffused by any team in a game since the 2004. And I read that. I was like, and it said Browns. I was like, oh, no. Uh, 26 yards, 26 yards game at Buffalo. That was not a, a Brady Quinn Browns team, though. Anyway. I was in college then. I was in college. Yes. I, well, I, I panicked for a second. I was like, oh, crap. And I was like, Brady, you never had one of these games. I'm like, oh, no, he, he, he did. Well, no. no, trust me. It would have never been mine. I, I know we had – I know Derek Anderson was two for 17 with interception one game. That game had to have been a poor – that was in 2009. So that had to have been a poor statistical game. So I was on that team. But it wasn't me playing. So yeah. uh, no, uh, this is a Jeff Garcia, Luke McCown, Kelly Holcomb uh, special. In terms of uh, in terms of the yardage gained by that Browns team, the Bears also averaged one point one yards per play, which means if you yeah. gave them ninety consecutive plays, they wouldn't score a touchdown. Um, 
Yeah. Well, the third fuse in the game since 1960. Yeah. Yes, right, right. They from the kickoff in theory they would. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, the yeah, second yeah. fuse by a, a team in any game this century. Miles Garrett had four and a half sacks, and uh, I believe came out and said on Tuesday that he was shocked that the Bears didn't move the pocket at all, and essentially just said, "Hey, okay. Justin Fields." So let's let, 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 let's let's okay. break this down for a minute. Yeah. So when you're going into a game like this, the one thing you don't let happen is their best player which is Miles Garrett, absolutely ruined the game. Like, that is job number one. That's the NFL. You don't let that happen. The fact that Matt Nagy and his staff allowed that to happen, didn't make any adjustments, it either speaks to a big (laughs) extreme negligence on the part of their game planning, or it speaks to a a 100% lack of execution. But, again, if you're putting a player in a one-on-one with Miles Garrett, you're not going to win that anyway. So that's the first issue that bothered me about it. The second thing was there was no in-game adjustments, which kind of shows you, again, either a lack of coaching, negligence scheme, whatever you want to call it. But it still falls under on, on Matt Nagy for that. He's the head coach. He's the offensive mind. Like, it all falls on him. But what bothers me about it is this is something that we saw in the preseason. Remember when they played the Buffalo Bills? You remember when Justin Fields got his head taken off? Mm-hmm. They brought that exact same pressure later on in the game. Now different result because fields got the ball off quicker and they brought a similar pressure to that not the exact same front and look but very similar off the edge still wasn't addressed and i thought oh it's just the preseason maybe they don't want a game plan for this maybe they don't want to make an adjustment with the protection on the o-line or the back or fields for that matter but it, it got me thinking like this is the same thing we saw in preseason from them and so un- unless justin fields just isn't you know, I mean, which the Miles Garrett thing is completely different. That's a DN. Like, he's got no part of that. Right. But unless the, the other part of piece of the nine sacks, the four and a half that came elsewhere, unless that had more to do with just him getting rid of the football, which I think there were a few that you could have made the case for, right? But outside of that, like, that falls on the coach for game planning. Like, he's not putting him in a position to succeed. So th- that was as bad of an actual game plan as I've seen uh, all year, maybe in a few years. Um, next to probably what we saw from the Philadelphia Eagles and, wow. uh, and what Nick Sir- Sirianni put on, on Monday night football. They're not even attempting to run the football with Jalen Hurts, given that that's what you do well. That's what you do best. So a couple of young quarterbacks just being put in awful positions right now. Yeah, and I saw where – I mean, you can see it in the game, but somebody did the breakdown of it. It was like 31 dropbacks and, you know, two designed runs for Justin Fields, like four play-action bootlegs. I mean, even if you just do the read option stuff, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting that they should have gone full 2012 Washington football team on it or anything, but if, if you use read option there, I don't know, maybe run it at Miles Garrett and force him to read the, read, you know, let, let, let the quarterback read Miles Garrett and take Miles Garrett out of the play by t- turning him from a pass rusher into somebody that you're, that you're allowing to, you know, I'm not saying it would have worked perfectly, but their plan was it. I thought all leading up to it, I picked the Bears to cover because I thought I said this several times on the radio. I said there's no way that Matt Nagy is like in theory, he's a smart enough human being and offensive coach that he is going to adjust the playbook and adjust the game plan for Justin Fields' specific skill set, which is not at all like Andy Dalton's specific skill set. And move the pocket, you know, run play action, bootlegs, you know, read option, whatever you got to do, get him out of the move and and get him comfortable, cut the field in half for him. There's so many things you could have done and they didn't do any of it. Right. And and, and none of those necessarily, you know, speak to like Justin Fields. To me, it has more to do with their offensive line. We knew their offensive line would struggle versus some of the better pass rush. Cleveland clearly has one of the best pass rushes in the AFC. So that's more of the alarming part is, just from a game planning standpoint, it wasn't set up with them to have an opportunity to succeed, whether it's Justin Fields, Andy Dalton, or Nick Foles for that matter. And then comes down the other, the other portion of it. If you're going to draft Justin Fields where you did, and you're going to have any chance of giving him success, your offense, just tear it up and throw it out. Like your offense needs to become what he does well. You should be calling up Ryan Day and say, hey, can I have your playbook? Like, let me look at this. Let me try to run a bunch of things that Justin Fields is good about. Or let's talk about the different things that we need to put in, verbiage-wise, whatever else. Because if he's the guy, he's the guy. Now, I will say this about Fields. Coming out, look, he's got a ton of upside, a ton of talent ability. I thought he was the second-best quarterback in the draft. But that's all based on potential, right? He still needs time to develop. 
I mean, with what he's seeing from NFL defenses, the fact that he played a year plus, I don't know if you really count last season as a full season, given how it was shortened and everything else, he still needs time to experience and play and, and adapt and adjust. So that's the hard part about it is, you know, they obviously wanted to try to probably set him, but they couldn't because Dalton gets hurt. You could have had Foles. We now somehow is right, there would have been pitch for, there been pitchforks and 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 bur- and like and and torches if they'd gone but, with Nick. But Foles now up. you but now you find yourself in the same spot. Like I actually think Matt Nagy did more damage to his reputation by putting Fields in there and giving him a terrible game plan no doubt. that makes him look that makes everyone look worse than just putting in Nick Foles and trying to operate and just say, look, we don't feel like Justin Fields is ready yet. And 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 and, and the thing about that that I never understand is. I don't give a crap what anyone on the outside thinks about whether or not they think the guy needs to play. When Pete, Pete says, oh, just play him, just play. Pete's play the not kid. there for practice. Play the kid. He, he's, he's not there for practice every day. He doesn't understand how it works. Like, and, and, and the coaching staff does to a degree. So part of me almost feels like maybe this is like was set up to be like, yeah, we're going to give him the same offense. We're going to have Andy Dalton or Nick Foles run. And if he can't execute it, so be it. That's on him. We're going to show everyone that he's not ready which is a terrible position to be in if you're a player and it doesn't speak much about you as a coach, if that's how you're going to operate. Well, and, and the other thing now I will interested, I don't can't believe I'm defending Matt Nagy in the slightest here, but you know, it is a little bit, it, it feels a little bit unfair that, you know, all preseason, like we're going with Andy Dalton. We, we don't want to play Justin Fields. Everybody's like, you play fields, you play fields. We're going to burn this palace all down. And then they actually play fields and he looks terrible. And everybody's like, well, that's all on Nagy. And it's like, well, I mean, maybe he had a point about the Dalton Field stuff before the season. Now, I mean, having said all that, you don't you don't buy into the conspiracy theory that Matt Nagy is purposely submarining the No, because unless he just feels like he's gonna fire no matter what. And so he'd rather at least try to have the guys in there that he thinks give him the best chance to win and you do something like this. But even then, that would be, I mean, <laughs> I, again, negligence isn't even the word for it. You know, no, it'd be malicious he, in, in his intent because this is a real man's game. Unless yeah. you've played the game and been hit like that, you don't understand the damage that you can do on someone's body. So, you know, if he's doing that and endangering a player like that, that in and of itself is is scary to think about. I would think he would never get another head coaching job again if that was somehow found out. But again, I, I think the, the toughest thing is, is, you know, he's, Matt Nagy has used all his scapegoats. He fired Mark Helfrich, who's got a good reputation as an offensive mind. He yep. fired Harry Heastand, who's viewed as one of the best offensive line coaches there is. Just go ask Dave Dior and when he's played for him. Uh, all the guys from Notre Dame that he coached during their time there. Go ask those guys who are now pro bowlers. So it wasn't them, but apparently Matt Nagy thought it was them. Then we blame Mitchell Trubisky for not growing and everything else. Mm. Now you have another talented quarterback. You bring in another free agent quarterback, and the offense still isn't clicking. So, well, wh- like, who are you pointing the finger at? At, at some point, you got to take accountability for how things are, and you have to adapt and adjust as a play caller, as a coach, to the strengths of what you have. And he hasn't done that. Since the first season he got there when they went 12-4, and four, he has not done that. So I, I'm not one who's going to call for people's jobs. But at this point, you know, I don't know what the Bears' front office is thinking you know, as they're watching this all unfold and watching what could be a very, very talented player at quarterback just get knocked around left and right. Like, if you're going to spend that draft capital, you're going to spend that draft pick on that player, you better hope you're going to at least protect him if you're going to put him out there to play. The the thing that I sort of started to think um, was that – oh, but I, was, I, was on, uh, I was on Lindsey Rhodes' podcast, uh, the, the NFL Road Show with Lindsey Rhodes, um, Sirius XM podcast. We were, people should go check it out. Great show. We had a good time, but we were like going nuts on Matt Nagy. Uh, and before we, I do, I do have a question. So this, this just reminded me, sorry, this is sort of a, a weird tangent. Have you, have you ever done uh, like a, like a video show with a laptop? Uh, what do you mean? Like, like, I mean, I'm doing, I'm doing this on an iPad right now. No, 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 no. I mean like, like where you sit at the desk with a laptop in front of you. Cause we were, we were, we were wondering, do Cause I like, I don't think I, I don't think I ever can visualize former NFL players doing these shows with like a, a computer in front of them. Um, I, I guess not. I mean, maybe if I had some notes I wrote down, I want to be reminded of, I mean, for example, on certain days we have like 20 some college football games with the sure. preview. So to be able to retain all that knowledge on a week to week basis, sometimes I'll put down some notes and have it on a piece of paper. Maybe no, 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 not a piece of paper. I mean, yeah. a computer. No, I, I don't bring up a computer with me, no. 
Yeah. Like, and, but we, we, we were just wondering, we, it's like suddenly hit us. Like we've never seen like David Carr, for instance, doesn't, you know, doesn't have a laptop in like in front of him or like you never see like Reggie Bush doesn't have a laptop in front of him. You know, like it's, I, 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 have you, have you ever noticed in a former player using a, like an actual computer at like a desk for a video show? I don't think I've ever seen it. No, I mean, I, I guess it, it's because you, you feel like you you played, you trust your eyes, you trust what you see, you trust what, you know, how you feel, what you're convicted by, you know, well, your experience. Computer, how computer doesn't yeah. that. Like, like if I look at a computer, that's not going to help me with anything. You yeah. Know, no. Like what, what's, what, what's the computer going to tell me well, that I haven't already seen or experienced? Well, my, my, the, the, the theory I was sort of operating on was that maybe it's, you know, it's like you, you didn't, like you would, you know, you would take a bag to, to the, you know, to the office sometimes, right? Like, a, but, but you wouldn't take like a computer sure. to work, right? To like an NFL, yeah, like NFL yeah, no. right, no. right. That's what I'm saying. No. So like NFL players don't. They're, they're like, why would I take it? Why would I carry a computer? Why around? did you do that? Yeah. yeah, like I'm. You know, if you're if you're a professional blogger, you know, maybe or a senior NFL blogger or something like that. You know, maybe you're used to carrying around a laptop and crack that thing open all the time. But if you're, for, I don't know, it's a weird observation. At any rate, I'm just. You know, I mean, I want to be. I want to be on the lookout. I'm going to see if I can find an NFL player with a laptop. I'm trying to think. I don't think I, I don't think I've ever seen. That's what I'm saying, right? Yeah. I've, I've yeah. never thought of it until yesterday. I mean, I've I've had my iPad up like during draft shows because you're you're trying to obviously follow and you're going oh, to go back and look at right because you've got hundreds of players being drafted. So you're like, wait, we're in the sixth round now. Who are they taking the third? Well, like you're trying to go back yeah. and remind yourself. You don't have to shuffle through a bunch of papers. Um, I think I'm using an iPad for that, but that's. That's a whole different animal. I don't know. I just thought it was a kind of an interesting observation. Like, I'm sure there's some some psychology to it. Uh, the NFL season is here. And to celebrate, Bud Light just unveiled their limited edition team cans designed for the fans. It's a custom design for each fan base, including this one right here for the Panthers. Hashtag for the fans. Hashtag rawr. Or rawr. Depending on how you say it. <laughs> uh, two states, one team. Touchdown. Yeah. Blue and black attack legends all kinds of fun stuff on there we had some of ours to, well you know we'll crack one on sunday for sure when we're watching some football they're hitting stores now and right. the only beer you're going to want to have in your fridge this season head over to budlight.com slash delivery now to find out how to get yours delivered that's budlight.com slash delivery okay not sure if you heard brady there is a game this weekend between two old friends mm -hmm. that's right it's uh I was. I needed. I didn't need. I had. I needed the schedule to make a joke. It's, it's the Brady Belichick, the 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 return of Tom Brady to New England. It is being. It's being treated as as you as one would expect. Do you do you find that this game is being overhyped yet, or is it too early in the week for us to to get the full exposure to this? Um. No. I look. It is one of the greatest storylines returns of any player to a former team that I think we've ever seen. Right. Yeah. I mean, you have you had your greats through you know the past, right? We had Brett Favre going back to Lambeau, uh, Joe Montana going back. What was the candlestick back then? If I'm not mistaken, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so, you know those those returns. I, I think to me, the difference with those returns and this is, it, it you kind of get the sense that like Tom wanted out and Tom wanted a different opportunity. Whereas with Brett Favre, like they drafted his replacement. Like it was like, Ruddy was on the wall, dude. Like, get out of here. Like, we, like eventually it was just, we're done. But I feel like, I feel like Belichick had more of a push out than and was being no, talked about at the time. Favre. Not than Favre. I mean, oh, no, 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 no. I just mean, and by I, the way, by the way, when first chance he got, he went to the division rival. Like, think about that. He went to a division at first, not obviously he was with the Jets for a little bit, but, to the but when he could, right. But when he could, and he, he had his choice, he went to the Vikings. He was like, no, no, no. I want to see them twice a year. Yeah. So that one, that was a little bit different. Um, for sure. I kind of, I kind of look at this though, is, you know, did Belichick maybe like, I, I think this is probably how it happened at the end. They didn't have much cap space that year. The team wasn't great anyway. So to sit there and say Tom felt like that was their best chance of winning a Super Bowl staying in New England, I think you'd be lying to yourself. But to act like they gave an offer that was, you know, equal to what the Bucs did, that probably wasn't the case either. I mean, when Bill Belichick comes out and says, well, yeah, no, we wanted to, we made an offer. Like, 
look, if you're selling me your house and I, I offer half a million below market, you're like, well, you don't really want to buy my house. You know, and, and, I, and I'm saying to you, well, you don't have any other offers. So half you know, a million below probably, market. <laughs> wait, wait, yeah. Really? Real blue collar of you there. <laughs> well, you, you, I, I know you live in a compound down there, by the way. I, I know it's a compound. Plenty of land for the, for the dogs. <laughs> For the dogs to be roaming around down there. So the Brinson compound Half is. A below market. <laughs> that, How dare you go 1.5 million below market at me? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I mean, so, I, know, I, know, I know what you're saying there. Like, I, but I do think that, I, I think Tom is. I mean, Tom's not coming. Wait, wait, wait. How, how old are you, Will? I am 40. So you probably remember Montana a little bit better than yeah, I yeah, do, yeah, for sure. right? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, because because I'm trying to think back. I grew up a big, you know, 49ers fan. And I'm trying to think back to that transition. Obviously, it's been well documented. Like I like Steve and Joe were close, but when he went to Kansas City, and they had a great team, by the way, it just they got unlucky. It seemed like there was like a little angst still, right? I mean, or am I wrong in assuming that when he went to Kansas City, there was angst between yeah coming back against San oh Frank. oh for sure yeah yeah yeah, and it was so he went to Kansas City in '93. Yeah, so I was like, yeah, I was thirteen, yeah, you know, I was or I was twelve years old, you know. So I mean, I, I mean, I've, I mean, I remember more vividly the the Steve Young Super Bowls, uh, it just right. you know, as a you know, as a teenager, right? But um, but yeah, a lot I mean, of I remember, first time memories for you when you were twelve, though. So that's good. I mean, I figured you it would be able to harken back to those memories. You know, I'm, a surprised, lot of I'm surprised I remember anything from from twelve or before. But I mean, yeah, I mean, not really was, catching on, but okay. Yeah, there was a, no, there was a ton of angst. There, there was there was a lot of vitriol. And I guess that's what I want to do. You, how much vitriol, how much bitterness, or not bitterness, because he won a Super Bowl, but how much of a. Uh, that's the other thing is like he, he already kind of like proved his point. I think the biggest thing about this is he's going to pass. I mean, the dumbest, I, I say this is the dumbest, but like he already has more career passing yards than Drew Brees. You count the play. But because, right? exactly. And because like, so he's going to do it in this game. Like there's no way he won't unless he got hurt. Uh, 60, 63 guy yards, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, unless Matt Nagy comes in and calls the plays for the Buccaneers, I, I think they're going to get it. So, uh, you know, that's a storyline into this, like who better to do against that is return to Foxborough. Um, I, I, like I get all the storylines and stuff to it. I just, I think he already kind of showed them like, Hey, what's up? <laughs> like I just yeah. went somewhere else, won a Super Bowl. Uh, you guys didn't make the playoffs. Now How about them apples, you know? Right. That's speaking, speaking of things from the the nineties. Little little uh, little goodwill hunting quote there. Um, yeah, yeah, I do think though. I was on Boston Radio on Tuesday morning with Toucher and Rich, and we were just talking about. It and they're like, "What? How do I you love those guys? They're, they're they're fantastic, by the way. They do a great show. They they do do a great show. Yeah, I go on every week. I know. Um, yeah, I I enjoy it because I can say whatever I want, and they like and they yeah you know, they they don't care. Um, we end up talking about like eighties death metal, and for fifteen minutes. At any rate, uh, Allison Chance, what? Yeah, sure. Well, that's that's really more nineties, but not know. death metal, but yeah, the morning, yeah. Eighties. That's nineties. That's nineties. Um, at any rate, <laughs> it's right there with Goodwill Hunting. At any rate, <laughs> um, the I I they asked me they're like, how do you think this plays out? I was like, look, I get that you know the first of all the but all the money is going to be on the Bucks and Brady. Everyone's going to bet on the Bucks minus six. I get it. I understand why. I mean, I think I if it's less than seven, I want some of the Bucks. I, I just feel like Tom Brady's going to go in there and say, listen, here's the deal. I'm going to light up. There's nothing, there's no mystique of Gillette stadium anymore. Certainly not for Tom Brady. He knows the ins and outs. He knows, he knows the wind direction. There's everything about the stadium. He's going to go in there and try to light the Patriots up. And he wants the Buccaneers defense to light Mac Jones up. So he can say, wow, you really made a great decision, Bill, to go with this. You know, you have this rookie instead of me. I'm down here winning Super Bowls with the Tommy and Gronky show. We're having the time of our lives and you're being Miz. With all these people who are doing the Patriots way, that's not even working anymore. How do you like me now? How do you like them apples? That's what's going on in Tom's the, head, in my opinion. So I think what's going on probably is he's meeting with Todd Bowles, and he's saying, here's what Josh is going to do in this. Here's what they're going to do in this. I mean, not that he's going to you know, want to do that during the course of the game. I think he wants to stay focused on what he's saying. But if he gets moments in the game, he'll probably watch and say, hey, this is what they're doing, and this is what they're – calling this i mean if you're the patriots you'd have to think that tom is selling out everything you've ever you know told <laughs> yeah. or said so so 
you know, Todd Bowles, those players are going to be listening for different code words. Mac Jones and Josh McDaniels have to switch those up. Um, you know, they're probably going to be well prepared for all that. Although Todd Bowles defense kind of got exposed last week, if we're being honest with ourselves. But um, and then I, for sure, no, it definitely did. But in a way that I don't think the Patriots can operate. Well, what the Patriots are going to do is run the football. Like they were going to try to run the football and limit the amount of times you see Tom Brady out there. Like Best that, of luck. they're not going to let Mac Jones and that's fine, but they're not going to let Mac, they'll find ways to get to the edges. Like, trust me, like that's, that's going to be the game plan. They're not going to, they're not going to try to find ways of, of drop back throwing the football 50 times. If they do that, the game's over. Yeah. It's already over. If, so if, they, if Mac Jones throws 40 plus times, they, they will have lost by double digits pretty easily. I feel like, all right. So, so I, I, I think if he throws 30 plus times, it's over. Like probably. you want to keep him below that number. And I think that's your best chance for success in this game. Limit the amount of touches Tom and that offense gets. Run the football, shorten the game. By the way, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're Tom Brady, me, or anyone else. If you shorten the amount of possessions I get in the game, it's frustrating. Like, it sucks to sit on the sidelines, get a series, you go down. Maybe opening series, they go down, it takes five minutes to kick a field goal, and then get the ball back with, like, 30 seconds left, a minute in the first quarter. Yeah. Like, what the hell happened to that quarter? And then next thing you know, you drive down, maybe get a touchdown. It's 10-3, 10, 10-7, 10, whatever the case is. Or maybe, maybe Chris Godwin drive, like, fumbles as he's trying to go in the end zone and, and the Patriots get the ball and it's 3-0. Three, it's three nothing. And next thing you know, you get the ball back with two minutes left in the half, you know? And it's like, that is the most frustrating thing. You can throw a pick or have a tip pick or whatever you want to say. The most frustrating thing is just not getting many opportunities to get out there on the field. Hmm. I, I think that's what they're going to try to do. And then from a defensive standpoint, I mean, I think they match up decently well with their secondary versus the, the, the Bucks on the outside. And they know what Gronk's going to do once he gets in there. So I almost wonder if they're going to use Gronk situationally as a decoy. Uh, and I also think the Bucs are going to try to want to, want to, want to run the football, if, if they're smart at least, and start getting things going there. Because you know that that's the one kryptonite where Bill wants to get, just like the Giants did to Tom Brady in the Super Bowls, he wants to get him in third and seven plus the entire game. Force him to be a drop back, see if he can't unleash some of those pressures and edge rushes on him. And see if he can't knock him around a little bit. Like that's that's this kryptonite. That's what we've seen has affected him. And so if they get the run game going early, it's night night. Like it's not going to matter if they're living in third and four to six the rest of the game. So when you were talking about getting the Patriots running on the edges, how, you know, because the the Bucks the Bucks are a what is called a pass funnel. You know, they have a really good defensive front that is hard to run against. What sort of what are you implementing if you're if you're New England to try and attack that that Buccaneers defense. It, it was, it, you know, Vita Van and Dominican Sue, you just can't really run straight at them. It just doesn't work out very well. Yeah, extra offensive linemen you're bringing is tight ends. You're bringing, extra, you know, multiple tight end sets, which plays their strengths of what they have. A True. lot of base personnel. And then when you want to throw the football, expanding from that base personnel. You know, they should live most of this game at 12, uh, two tight end sets. And then however you want to do it, whether you've got a YY set where both, you know, Hunter Henry and, and Johnny Smith are on the same side, and you, you can either, you know, run based off the safety rotation to the short side or to that side, however you go about doing it. There's a bunch of different ways you can try to get to some of those edges and even incorporating a little motion, whether, whether you know, wide receivers going to come down and crack block, and now you're free releasing your off the ball tight end up on the second level. So there's a bunch of different ways of getting to the edges. The, the hard thing is just try, trying to finding a way of, of getting it done once you get out there in the game, right? I mean, this is a fast flow defense with their linebackers. The safeties typically give great run support. And so you might have to get some of those, you know, one of the things uh, Josh would call them is not RPOs, but uh, run action pass. So yeah. a lot of those more stretch outside zone plays, extending the football out, everyone's blocking the run, but really it's a fake off it and you're throwing. You got and one or two and, and, and that's I, it. And Hunter Henry's leaking over the middle and you're just trying to dump it off and pick up. Either, well, like the, the little trap pass that like Peyton, you know, everyone talks about Peyton, I made it famous. You pull the backside guard, you know, a little flash fake, always sucks up the linebacker, tight end in and behind. Everyone's crushed that and used that, used that for years. Um, but, you know, they like to call them little pop passes, you know, needle, prick, like some of that terminology where you've hey, got hey. a post, a little skinny post on the front side of the play and the back side, you've got what they call a prick route where you're going to come almost like a curl and, and, and work your way back out. Um, those are your two options. That's all you really got on that play. So if those aren't there, you're throwing it away or maybe your back leaks out. But a lot of those sorts of, I think, you know, run action pass plays to sell it out you know, when they're not trying to run the football and then take some of the pressure off back Jones. Because th that's the one thing I think you lose the game with is if a, your rookie quarterback, Mac Jones, uh, who didn't play particularly well uh, mm -hmm. this past week, if you're, if, you're, if you're letting him feel the pressure of the GOAT coming back in his old house, you know what I'm saying? Like, 
that's yeah. where you lose the game like that is if you let him feel the magnitude of what this game could mean. I don't want Mac Jones getting anywhere near Tom Brady pregame. You know, like don't let him. Oh, he will though. Oh, he, he will. will. Yeah. You know, Tom will get near Mac. Because, because, damn, like he's Mac Jones. Like he's going to walk in there with a little sense of, of confidence, just like he has his entire career. Sure. When everyone doubted him, he went and put together a ridiculous season, won the national championship. My name's McCorkle, like, that, mother. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what quarterbacks think. Yeah. Like, literally, every quarterback thinks they could walk in and do the same things Tom Brady did if he was given Bill Belichick and those offenses, and those defenses, and teams he played with. Like, we are cocky dudes. We all think that. I mean, look at Matt Stafford now, case in point. He, he struggled with the – I mean, he had some good seasons with the Lions, but – now you look at him as oh, okay. Now he's an MVP candidate. Everyone says the Rams are playing he's the best. Future team Hall of Famer. He's a yeah. I, I mean, think about that. If he had spent his entire career with the Rams and the way this is working out, you, your, your narrative about him would be entirely different. And that's why, like situation and circumstance, any player, any position, always trump even their own ability because everyone's got ability once they get to the NFL. Like all these kids from the time, for the most part, junior high, high school, college, they've all been ballers. And what it just stops once they get to the NFL level. Like injuries play a portion of it, but the position that you're put in with an organization, that coaching staff, the scheme, all that's going to be paramount to anything as far as your ability goes. I, I, I was the one – I've been saying that Matt Stafford will end up being a Hall of Famer once he gets out of Detroit. And now he, he landed in a perfect spot. Now, he probably needs to, you know, make a Super Bowl, maybe even win a Super Bowl. No, you have to be- win a Super Bowl. Because I, I think if – like Matt Ryan right now, if he'd won a Super Bowl, I think you're saying with the stats – that's a, that's a Hall of Famer. Matt Ryan. Well, without if, the Super Bowl. Yeah. If, if, the, if, the, if the Falcons beat the Patriots, oh, Matt Ryan is a, is a, is a Hall of Famer. In fact, you know what? Why not, why, why not shout out my ice cold take presented by Bud Light right now? That's right. I'm going to double down on my guy, Matthew Stafford, and say, I don't know why we're in the middle of a Patriots conversation, but whatever. My ice cold take is that Matthew Stafford, by the end of his career, will have done enough to warrant induction into Canton and the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Now, of course, things have to happen for this to work. He probably has to win a Super Bowl, but he is there in terms of statistics. Not probably. He, you got to win a Super Bowl. Like, if Eli's going to get in, it's because of the Super Bowls. It's not because of his stats or anything he did in the regular season. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the ice cold take is that Eli Manning shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame, but he he's going to get in. Uh, so, yes, all right, there it is. I'll say it. Ice Cold Take presented by Bud Light is that the Rams will win a Super Bowl with Matthew Stafford and he will get in the Hall of Fame. And then I will shove it in Pete Prisco's face repeatedly for the rest of his old wrinkly life. That's the Ice Cold Take presented by Bud Light. Go to uh, BudLight.com slash delivery to get your Bud Light sent to you now. Um, okay, so back to, back to the Pats. We, you mentioned the, um, the, the advantage that you know, Tom Brady is going to give Todd Bowles all this information. Do you think there's also a built-in advantage with – Belichick and the defensive coaches knowing what Tom Brady likes and what Tom Brady likes to do, or is that, can that be nullified by more easily than the other way around? Um, I, I, it's tough because I think situationally, yeah, they like, obviously they've sat back and watched and seen what he struggles with. Um, and so there's an advantage to a degree, but that's the hard part is, you know, Tom Brady's able to share, what he knows about both sides of the ball with their team, you know, personnel, all that kind of stuff. You know, the Patriots can only share tidbits about personnel, about two guys, you know, Rob Gronkowski and and Tom Brady. (laughs) Tom's great. And And, Rob's big and runs seam routes. It's like, congratulations. You got it all. And so then, and so then as far as the information, how it helps, uh, it still plays to the favor of Tom Brady because he's given up information about both sides. You know, Bill Belichick's only going to be able to help out his defense going against the Brady in that offense. And again, situationally, because, you know, oh, we're going to stop Tom Brady. Okay, well, you better load up the box, though, to stop the rushing attack. It's not like Tampa can't run the football. So you got to be aware of all those things. Um, And that's why I feel like at the end of the day, uh, as much as we talk about the storylines behind them, it, it comes down to what Bill Belichick prioritizes as the biggest weapons they have, you know, trying to take away. Uh, you know, is it Chris Godwin? Is it Mike Evans? Like, like, who is he prioritizing on that offensive taking away situationally with the way they go about doubling? Um, and so that, that's going to be the biggest key. If Is there – how how many different layer, levels of chess gets played here in the sense of, you know, the uh, – the, you know, you've got 
you've got Tom Brady who knows what the, 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 what the, uh, what the Patriots like to use and say in, in the terminology and all of that Do the Patriots then create fake terminology that looks like this or something that looks like this, if, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, no, like, I mean, we, 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 so, so for example, like last night, or excuse me, um, Monday Night Football, you had Philly and Dallas. And at one point in the broadcast, you could hear them, you know, me on Bob Ross, Bob Ross, right? Which obviously a painter draw, right? So you're going to have variations of code words for plays like that. Uh, anytime you're in a hurry up, anytime you you hear a, um, you know, not necessarily check with me, but just an overall audible. You're going to hear that from time to time, you know, different code words. Like we used to always use, you know, for example, if it was uh, a Mark male Davis, Mark name. Davis, Omaha. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, um, I mean, and so yeah. that would, that for us, that would have used to be a run to the right, you know? And then if it was, Dude, what was your, um, what was your code to the right? What was the, what was the run to the right? Well, it, it could be, it could be male, female, you know, male to the right, female to the left. It could be uh, anything with an R in it, any word with an R in it to the right, any word right. with an L in it to the left, which, always helped you kind of disguise a little bit of that because you could say a bunch of different things. You could say, you know, states to the right, cities to the left. You know, now you got to hope that you don't pick one that happens to, you know, could potentially be both, but, um, you know, or, well, I'm just saying or that, you, you know, or you hope that, or you hope that your, your linemen are smarter, your linemen are running right, back. Remember right. what are cities that, that, and what are states. <laughs> right. Like, like that's uh, the Kansas is like, a wait, state, wait a isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then you ask people, uh, so where's where's Kansas City? Yeah. Uh, it's in Kansas, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, there is a Kansas City, Kansas, but it's actually in Missouri, technically. Like oh, the, the big Kansas City yeah. we're talking about. Uh, so you got to be careful with the COVID. You didn't but mean Nebraska, get... North Carolina? Golly. Yeah. But that stuff, I mean, look, every week we would go back and listen to the TV copy to see what you could hear on the audio to then take back and say, we need to change this, we need to change this. So that's always been going on, maybe a little bit more so with um, the fact that it's Tom Brady and Bill Belichick. They know each other so well. But again, you look at divisional opponents like Brian Flores and the Dolphins, Gary, you know, uh, George Godsey, you know, they're, they're offensive coordinator. Like all these, these different coaches who've been there, like they always have to kind of worry about that whenever you're playing against teams with this familiarity. I'm trying to, now I'm trying to think there's somebody that does a right, a, a run right. There's like a good, it's like somebody who's like a right handed person or somebody's a lefty there's like a there's like clayton kershaw clayton kershaw you know because he's a lefty pitcher and you know, you know that means yeah that means good left but then you have to assume everybody has to know whether the pitcher's left or right-handed yeah you don't want to make it too complicated trust yeah. me like right. you get the heat of the game and all that guys forget the snap count okay like right. the very essence of how a play begins guys will forget and sometimes like those code words almost never change because you got guys playing half concussed that need to know what the snap count is so they have they have to be even though they're not fully functioning, sometimes they have to be able to actually remember that stuff. <laughs> Phil Mickelson, Phil Mickelson. It's like, uh, who's this? Yeah. Some guy's like, what the hell is that? Yeah, who's Phil Mickelson? Um, who, feeling who? Who am I feeling? <laughs> feeling a Michelob? All you know. <laughs> Mi- hey, hey, hey. Um, and, uh, yeah. Save, save, save for another podcast, Kefka. Um, the uh, all right. So the game itself. How do you think this plays out? I mean, can you can you talk me into a scenario where the Patriots win this? I think it would take a number of turnovers for Tom, you know, him getting disguised. I think one of the best things that they do is disguising coverages with the way they kind of play and manipulate their safeties. And it's just subtleties, you know, um, in particular, the way they go about doubling a player or even just um, whether it, whether it's they're doubling two players, doubling one, like they'll at times, you know, be playing different leverages or combo coverages. That's always tough to, to, to see, right? Like as a quarterback, there's a few different things you're looking for. Obviously, you look for safety rotation. That gives you an idea if it's a split safety look. It's some sort of form of cover two, cover four, quarter, quarter, half. Some teams call that eight. Some teams call it six, depending on the system you're in. You know, um, if you go with a post eye safety look, okay, you know, is it um, is it just cover one? What variation of cover one or man? Cover three? Is it, you know, uh, three weak, three strong? However, they're looking at that. And then there's variations off of post eye safety, right? You can cloud a side. Another side's open access. It just depends. So they do as good of a job as anyone at disguising that. And then what they do sometimes is you'll play like cloud to one side and cover three to the other, which kind of goes against a lot of as a quarterback, you're dropping back, diagnosing what you're getting. Because if you're dropping back, seeing a single high look, and then you look over that, it's, it's cloud coverage. Well, guess what? You just work to the wrong side for right. your pre-snap look. So you better get back on track to the, to the right side of the right progression or know which route is going to beat against that leverage or win and, against that leverage. So, and this is all happening in – in seconds. I mean, right. you've got to get the ball to your hand in three and a half seconds, roughly. 
If yeah. you're handing it to four, you're, you're, you're gambling at that point. So right. that's, that's how fast you have to be able to think, diagnose, and understand where the football needs to go. Um, so, you know, look, I, I don't think that's going to be that big of an issue for Tom. Things probably move so slow for him out there. I mean, it's just – it's got to move at a, at a just snail's pace. And I also think they do a good job of giving him natural indicators, which that's one thing that I'm looking, always looking for. So anytime you put it to a running back or a, um, a tight end outside – and you look at who's on him. If it's a cornerback, it's zone. If it's a safety, it's man. Well, if you start breaking those rules in this particular game and you don't give Tom that information, it puts more pressure on him to have to read after the snap of the football. And so if you're matching up a cornerback, for example, against Rob Gronkowski, um, and he's all the way outside, and then he comes back inside, I mean, there's all sorts of different ways in their, in their nickel packages or dime packages where they can break some of their rules and make it difficult to discern how they're going to play bunches, stacks, mm. you know, third down, man to man coverages. Okay. Uh, so who you got? I got Tampa. I, I think they're just a better football team right now. Yeah. Uh, I think they could put more pressure on Mac Jones. I don't think they'll be able to run the football effectively. I think they'll try, but uh, I, I've got Tampa. I think they're just a, the better football team of the two. It looks like the weather's going to be fine too, which I, I think sloppy weather would benefit Mac Jones. You know, I, I, ironically, Sloppy weather would benefit the the not Tom Brady in Gillette Stadium. Like, wouldn't that wouldn't that be funny yeah. if it was like pouring down rain or something like that? Uh, do you would, do you think this would be high scoring, low scoring? I said it was sort of a sloppy. Uh, I, I, I I think I think low scoring game. I, yeah. I don't foresee a ton of points being scored. I, I do think they'll sling the football around a little bit if they get the chance to. They'll take their shots, but I think it'll be a low scoring game. Well, and I think if Tampa gets a let's say a ten to fourteen point lead, then it's sort of over. Like it, it right. It plays into Tampa extending the lead by pressuring Mac Jones, Mac Jones forcing things. I mean, Mac, Mac was their leading rusher last week. That's – and threw it 51 times. That can't happen again or else it's no. like blow up. No, and, and, and look, it's not like that Tampa doesn't have – and they're bringing in Richie Sherman, talking to him. Maybe, you know, he's coming back for, for this sort of game. But um, I'm trying to think of the cornerback's name that came in uh, for Dean, who, who – Jamal Dean is down. You know, they got picked on a, a decent amount. Yeah. And that's, that's a concern because I think – Outside of that, you don't really look at the roster for the Pats and say, oh, they match up well uh, against the weaknesses of Tampa Bay Bucks. You know, I, I think that's anything like the, the Pats need. Is it Cockrell or Delaney? That, Delaney. I'm thinking yeah, of Delaney. Yeah. Cockrell plays more kind of in the slot. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, uh, Delaney was the one there. It's kind of getting picked on a decent amount. So I, I suspect they'll try to go after him if he's going to be the starter at that side. That would be the only spot that I'd, I'd be a little bit concerned by. And you give him some cloud coverage to help out. Yep. All right. I'm with you. I got Tampa too. Uh, Tampa too. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. get it? Uh, yeah, Tampa too. Yeah, it's like a uh, universal I, signal for every defense. They turn around, and go like this. As Tampa a quarterback, you're like, uh, obviously, you're checking the Tampa. All right, cool. Wait, wait. The defense is turned around and do a big T. Yeah, like, they would literally like during the snap, you'd shift their motion, do something, and the Mike linebacker turn around, and go, hey, hey, hey. They would say, but you're like, Tampa, Tampa. What? And I'd just be like, okay, hey, uh, we're either going to run the football or we're going to run a Tampa 2 beater. Like, it's not you that know, complicated. You know, it'd be uh, fun. You know, like they do the NASCAR experiences where you get to ride around with the, you know, the NASCAR riders or whatever. Yeah. They should do an NFL experience, but like, you know, so like I could go play quarterback for, you know, just, yeah. But yeah. I don't get hit. Put I don't you, get how about this? We put you in a baby Bajoran. All right. We put you on a quarterback and he just <laughs> drops back with you right there on his back. Yeah. Yeah. And you do get hit. You no, do get those experience. No. You know who no needs pads. that more than anyone? Pete Prisco needs that more than anyone because he's the one that like thinks he's tough, and then he actually gets hit in the NFL game. It's like, oh, 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 he just walks off the field. He's like, I don't, I don't want that. I don't walk want off the field. Back. He ain't walking off. If he gets, if he gets, he gets like Miles Garrett come from the blind side. It's night, night, Pete. We'll, uh, we'll see. You oh, at your God. funeral, pal. Would there be anything better than seeing him getting ragdolled? That'd be the one of the funniest <laughs> things I think I've ever seen. How much would you? If like we did a GoFundMe, how much do you think we could raise? A million dollars. A million dollars. <laughs> there are that many people that would look forward to that. <laughs> we need it. That's a that's a next year for St. Jude's. That's what we need to do. Is get Miles Garrett to ragdoll correct. Pete Prisco. They just we'll whip him around. Like no, we're not talking like we're not. You don't get a ten minute Zoom call with Pete. We we raise a million dollars and we will video Prisco getting just bludgeoned by Miles Garrett and. Pete would probably do that. it just to be like, yeah, I'm not scared of him. I'm not scared of him. I, I can do it. I, I, does, I can play in the NFL. He writes, he writes poetry and likes dinosaurs. Bring it on, big man. Um, all right. That's it for the Brady Quinn Football Show. Brady, as always, a pleasure, buddy. Thanks, and uh, we'll talk to you next week, man. Have a great week. Sounds good.